In a recent meeting with a doctor, I recounted a workplace injury I sustained here once, and he paused for a moment and replied, libraries sound like dangerous places. At the very least, they do put, it, put us at risk for a rather precarious state of being that Robin Blazer called astonishment, a word which emerges etymologically from the antithesis of what libraries are often equated with, the root word meaning to sound, to deafen, to resonate, to thunder. To be in a library is to be in a kind of holy forest. In 1955, a few short years after the poetry room from, moved from its original home in Widener Library to Lamont, uh, Blazer accepted a position at Widener. And in the three years that he worked there and lived in Boston, he claims to have experienced his coming into being as a poet a time when he began to distinguish his work from that of Spicer and Duncan and to initiate himself into the thinking and questioning that would give rise to his patiently aggregating poetics. For Blazer, astonishment was not a passive reaction, but an active engagement, what he describes as, quote, the business of unknowing, of the working always with the darkness, with the unknown and the incomprehensible. A tape is itself an astonishment, a kind of engagement with the unknown, a casting of one's voice headlong into the future without your body to define or defend it. Making these tapes in 1974, hardly end of life or deathbed editions or auditions, but midway through the journey, strikes me as a characteristically brave move on Blazer's part, done so within what he calls, quote, the darkness of the lived instant. We are so honored to have Miriam Nichols here this evening, grateful not only for her long geographic journey to join us tonight, but also for her sustained temporal and intellectual journey through Blazer's life and work. Her commitment is a model. Please welcome uh, Miriam Nichols. Christina, thank you so much for that and for Mary to help this visit happen. I'm very happy to be here, and so would Robin. He would be very happy to be here tonight. Can you hear me a little bit more? Yeah, yeah, is that better? The mic is just a recording mic. Okay, okay. I don't think she's mic'd. I'm not mic'd. We never mic'd this one. I'll just use my lecture voice, is that better? <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, well. Again, I'm very happy to be here, and I know Robin would like to, you know, would be very thrilled to think that he was coming back in this way with these books. Um, so I have commentary, and then I have, I'm going to intercut my commentary with six little clips. Um, anyway, as I, was, as I was saying before my computer interrupted me, um, I was going to tell you uh, more about the history of the tapes, but I thought, I changed my mind. I thought it was more important to, to say what I think about these tapes carries forward to now. And what's different about the poetic that comes out of them than a lot of what I'm hearing now in poetic. So um, if you want to ask me more about the history of them, um, by all means, afterwards. But I've kind of reduced those remarks quite, quite a bit. Okay, so I'm just going to start. The Astonishment Tapes came about because Warren Tolman, UBC professor and avid supporter of the New American Poetry, asked Robin Blazer to record an account of his life and ventures in poetry with Jack Spicer and Robert Duncan at Berkeley. Over 10 evening sessions conducted during the spring of 1974 in Warren's company and that of several fellow poets, Blazer talked about his life and writing. Woven into the autobiography and in Blazer's view of more importance was the story of a poetry and poetics under construction. The conversational context of the recordings, of course, led to many indirections and repetitions and in the end, the tapes were never finished. Blazer gets as far as an account of modernism as he, Spicer, and Duncan discovered it at Berkeley, and after that, he let the sessions drop. What exists, however, is enough to fill about 840 pages of transcript. 
the publication I'm here to launch tonight is an edited version of that transcript, and I will tell you, it, I cut it in half. Mm. If you want the whole nine yards, you can get it online. I'll make it available online. Um, the tapes, I have to say, too, were the edit job from hell. <laughs> Poor sound quality, impossibly difficult decision on cuts, not to mention a large, unwieldy manuscript at the end of it all that had to be edited. So, why not leave them in the archives? Beyond whatever the astonishments say about Blazer and the post-war Berkeley scene, they bring forward something else about that period that has become nearly invisible now, I think. Mm -hmm. A view of poetry that seems to belong to the gone world. What I want to try to say by way of introduction to them is what that is. Blazer makes it very clear on the tapes that his most revered model and mentor is Dante. From memories of reading the Doré illustrated in Ferno as a child, to the classes that he took with medieval historian Ernst Kantorowicz at Berkeley, alongside Spicer and Duncan, Dante was a constant. He is a constant in the poetry as well, from Blazer's earliest statement poem, The Hunger of Sound, through Cups, all the way to the great companion poem of 1997 that is given over to Dante. What seems to have really stuck with Blazer was that Dante took elements of contemporary life around him, that is, historical persons and events, and molded that life into a world image that gave shape and meaning to experience. Blazer was ambitious for nothing less. <clears throat> the tapes also make clear, and this follows from such an ambition, that Blazer and his peers took poetry very seriously as a vocation and a calling rather than a career. Blazer describes the poetry wars between them as a battle of what was to count for real. In 1974, he was still talking about world image and cosmology as the real business of poetry. I think the phrase could be flipped as well to say that poetry as Blazer conceived of it was the business of the real. In this clip, I'll, the first clip I'll play you, um, he speaks of the, the tale of being alive. It is ontology, he says, and the poet writes it as mythic narrative. You'll find with the clips as I play them, there's a lot more in them than I can comment on. This is the nature of the astonishment tapes. One thing turns into another thing, turns into another thing, and the sentence never ends. But I'm doing my best to kind of corral that a bit. So first clip. Field ontology is quite frankly a language and experience of the beginning of origin. The word ontology means being. It's the present participle of the verb to be. And as a consequence, it's the thought of being alive that's involved in it. And um, this is going to lead me in the, if, if these things really work into a, another whole movement finally, because there's a big attack upon this business of origin and ontology, which basically is mythology, and why all of, well, all of the, the poets all work with mythos, with a narrative that has a tendency to tell a tale about being alive and the duplicity I keep trying to describe in about a dozen different ways it is difficult to understand because it questions what we think uh, of as substantial. That is to say, what is not accidental but actually the nature of the real and keeps going back. The nature of the real, not in philosophical terms, but in the narrative that is the experience of the real and moves back to what I love about it is that it moves back before what one is oneself and then moves after what we are as men. And it has that so that ontology begins to be an, an actual metaphysical narrative and puts the best poetry always in, it seems to me, the greatest poetry always into a metaphysical aspect. In the metaphysical aspect. So I, you know, the sentence keeps going. I have to cut at some point. I'm assuming that few poets now would articulate their work in quite these terms as metaphysical narrative or mythos or world image. 
I want to list some of the reasons why this is so, and then return to the tapes to see if what Blazer says there in any way suggests a response to the objections against such a hefty project, or even a different way forward from the mid-20th century to where we are now. To do this, I don't think I can do better than return to some of the key essays delivered at the Recovery of the Public World Conference of 1995. This conference was held in Vancouver at the Emily Carr College of Art and Design, both to celebrate Blazer's 70th birthday and the publication of the collected serial poems for the first time in The Holy Forest. That came out with Coach House in 1993. It was an international event with some pretty high-powered people there in attendance, and not all of them were there for a fest shift. Some were quite clear on the notion that there is no public world to be had, and hence no chance of recovering one that had never taken place to begin with. The following papers say why. I have three of them that I will mention. And I think they say it clearly enough to make visible the cultural turn that happened sometime in the 1970s. This was a turn that shifted the terms of the conversation about poetry away from anything like world image or the making of the real. A Dorno scholar, Robert Hewlett Kenter, begins an essay titled Past Tense, Ethics, Aesthetics, and the Recovery of the Public World this way. So this is the first paragraph of his essay delivered at the Recovery of the Public World Conference. Those of you clinging to the sides of your chairs in dread anticipation of a discussion of ethics, aesthetics, and the public world can relax. <laughs> I don't intend to launch into these matters with any pretense that they are alive to us, as if the various debates implicit in the topic are just waiting for troops to join battle. Though not so long ago, people did vigorously discuss such issues without too terrible a sense of putting themselves on. These concepts and their nexus now have a stale, remote, archaic quality. A team of archaeologists sent out on their behalf that somehow turned up their mummified remains in a cache of steel-gray army trunks and unravel the shrouds would, under their very eyes, see these concepts change to dust. Ethics, aesthetics, and the public world. In the essay that follows, Hewlett Kenter begins with a suggestion that the public realm has always been a facade for economic manipulation. However, he dates the complete dependency of society and the market and the exchange relation from the 17th century and then suggests that whatever relationships might claim to rise above exchange are progressively perceived as an illegitimate universal. We have then an intensification of market effects to the point where the individual can no longer even imagine a world because the social whole has disappeared into the everywhere and nowhere of the global market. And as well, a philosophical deconstruction of the idealist tradition that has undermined the credibility of universals. In such a situation, dialectical opposition to public policy, such policy controlled by market forces, is not thinkable, and neither is the question of individual responsibility. I'm still following his argument, which, Hewlett Kenter says, supposes a relationship between the individual and the social whole. In this context, neither the many forms of postmodernism nor identity politics have torque because they simply offer an array of ostensibly equal and balkanized differences. Think of the race, class, gender, ethnicity, and sex litany of the 90s that have nothing visible or concrete to oppose nor any mechanism to do so. Hewlett Kenter is talking political economy, not poetry but his point that the social whole cannot be grasped experientially bears significantly on the conditions that serious art had and has to answer to. In a completely different kind of discourse, so I'm on to the second essay from that conference now. Steve McCaffrey 
makes an analogous point in his conference essay titled Blazer's Delusian Folds. The essay suggests how theory, perhaps inadvertently, contributed to the collapse of worldliness. McCaffrey reads Blazer through the Delusian fold and with good reason. Blazer turned to the Baroque explicitly in the later poems of the Holy Forest, particularly Deleuze's The Fold, but he used the trope as early as the 1960s in the first imagination poem. Here he is in the tapes, this is my second clip, in the Dante chapter on folding. This is a, a verb he uses over and over in all kinds of contexts. So in this clip, it's the folding of autobiography and poetry, language and experience. Okay, so the folding there. McCaffrey's is a careful, nuanced reading of Blazer's origami. That's his term. And I can't do justice to it in a brief summary. However, I do want to lift out one crucial element. McCaffrey points out that the concept of the fold works against the fragment, that is the edged, discrete entity and hence against oppositional relationships. There are unintended echoes here of Hewlett Kenter, although in a different lexical register and to a different end. The decentering of the entity and the consequent reconceptualization of the self as thematized in continental theory was received by many literary critics in the 70s and 80s as a liberation from the reality claims of ego-centered consciousness. Blazer's version of decentering is, as McCaffrey points out, implicit in this serial poem. The self is enfolded in the world and made temporal. Or, as Blazer has it, language and experience reverse into each other. The price of decentering, however, is a reduction in the perceived efficacy of individual agency. Diminished agency. And without at least the possibility of agency, the idea of a public world and a public poetry of Dantean scale seems delusional, is the subject of Charles Altieri's essay, my third example, from the conference called Some Problems About Agency in the Theories of Radical Poetics. Altieri focuses on Charles Bernstein, not Blazer and particularly on the shift from writer to reader in the attentions of language poets. If there can be no generalizable addressee for poetry, he says, then poetry will either be balkanized, its audience limited to coterie, or induced to the, quote, infantile rage that the gods offer the marginalized. The focus on the reader as a producer of meaning seems to undercut the possibility of poetry as a site of possible idealizations and exemplarities. Exemplarity in Altieri's view supposes that the reader identify provisionally with the world of the text, the point being to expand his or her imaginative range. If, however, all idealizations are to be considered as ideologically suspect, then radical poetry is left with negation 
in Altieri's terms, the negative work of resistance, or formalism, uh, and I quote, a version of compositional dynamics in which the pleasures of the material text are asked to carry the axiological burdens. As negation, it will be limited to a critique of what is. As formalism, it will be stuck with exposing its own devices. In neither case can the poet propose anything like a worldview, because as we know, there are many worlds, none of them whole and none disinterested or spontaneous. So, from those three essays, to summarize, Poetry cannot take on the kind of big Dantean project Blazer proposes because first, there is no possibility of grasping the social whole in a planet where the global economy dictates policy and makes a sham of democratic public engagement. Secondly, form and substance have been superseded, both in philosophy and science, by processes that cannot be grasped as discrete. Hence, there is no self to grasp a world that is not there anyway. Thirdly, the mediated nature of experience and the cultural manyness of any conceivable readership for anything undercuts the possibility of poetry as idealization. It would seem then that as Hewlett Cantor says, concepts like ethics, aesthetics, and the public world do indeed turn to dust before our eyes. And with them, of course, big world saying poems. So, I return now to the question of whether the astonishment tapes and the poetics projected there might suggest alternatives to these diminishments suggested by the above essays, or whether Blazer just didn't get the memo. <laughs> I will take up the Arantian problem first, the one that Hewlett Cantor touches on. Blazer promises an evening on a rent for the tapes, but he never gets there. He had, however, already published Particles in 1969, an essay on poetry and politics which begins with an acknowledgement of Arendt as mentor. In Particles and in the much later essay, Recovery of the Public World, this is very confusing. There are three, four pieces with the same title, Recovery of the Public World. It's a group of essays on Hannah Arendt. It was the conference, it was <coughs> Robin's essay, and then it's a title of the conference proceedings. So this one I'm talking about is Robin's essay. So in that essay, Blazer embraces Arendt's distinction between the social and political. And it is this distinction that allows him to make an analogy between Arendt's space of appearance and the spaces of poetry. Among Arendt's readers, this distinction is one of the most debated. Arendt gives to the social everything that is usually understood as political. This includes all matters pertaining to necessity, food, shelter, sanitation, and health, as Blazer parses it. Arendt's critics find it incredible that she would not treat these common concerns as political, when attention to such needs clearly depends on economic systems and political decisions about the distribution of resources. This critique parallels that of Hewlett Cantor, who begins his essay with the idea that the public good has always been tied to wealth or goods. I can't allow my argument to expand to fully discuss Arendt's political philosophy, but I do want to suggest that Arendt's space of appearance remains a live concept for poets and political thinkers too, because it brings to visibility what in personhood exists in excessive necessity. Following Arendt, Blazer insists that the human real is not exhausted by need. If the only definition of the public is what people share through common need, or for that matter, what they can agree on in the realm of ideas, then there is no public space in the Arendtian sense and no link to the arts as Blazer understood it. However, in Particles, he argues that what we share is our particularity. And we fashion this particularity through our seeing and saying of the world. What the poet reaches for is an articulation, a singular visibility that, because it is sighted and situational, is always also a perspective on the world. The poet's agency lies in that articulation. 
politics in the common sense meaning of the term as the administration of shared needs is called to, uh, upon to account for its constituents. It is not mandated to fabricate these constituents. A space of appearance, and I think here the poet space is analogous to Arendt's, reveals what is there to be accounted for. In Blazer's view, the ongoing task of the arts is to hold open a space that is its public character, where the real may come to visibility. And this is my third clip. The artwork is a thing to which something else adheres. This is the open that I have said is the poetic having a great intimacy of the quality of its form. A work holds the open. A work, a poem, makes space for the real that only includes us. It liberates the open and establishes it in the structure of our lives. Um, so as that clip goes on, you get in more Heideggerian language, which is a whole other commentary, and that's why I cut it at that point. Okay, so holding open the space, right? Um, <clears throat> how does he do this? So, in many a found poem, in the series Syntax, for example, Blazer enacts his version of the poem as open space. And I think it's worth noting to the uh, experiment open space, the journal open space in San Francisco, 1964 to 1965, edited by Stan Persky, it was literally, um, a place, um, and it was parallel with Buzz Gallery in, that was open in San Francisco at the same time, where people in, in the friendship group, basically in the community, could just publish whatever they were working on and, and share it around, so people could see what, what, who was doing what. Okay, so this is my example of what might come up into an open space. Um, this is a found poem. Um, from Robin's Syntax, and it's by Opal Whiteley. After I did look looks at the clock, I did look looks out the front window. There are calf tracks by our front window. These tracks are there because when I went walking with Elizabeth Barrett Browning on yesterday, I had her wait at the front step while I did go into the kitchen to get her some sugar lumps. She has a fondness for sweet things. I think she will grow up to be a lovely cow. Her mooings now are very musical and there is poetry in her tracks. She does make such dainty ones. When they dry up in the lane, I dig up her tracks and I save them. There is much poetry in them. By her own account and that of her grandmother, Opal Whiteley was brought up in a strict rural household and often punished for daydreaming. She was not, in other words, born to power. But she was able to fashion herself by making known a sharply angled perspective on her world through a distinctive language use. Here is a little clip from the tapes about the reversibility of self and world. So this being able, well, I'm still on about being able to make an appearance, to come into an appearance. Uh, this is clip four. All those aspects of the world uh, image, uh, if you take that, that uh, Edith Kopp essay, The Ecology of Imagination, that I like so much, where she says, I'm going to oppose all most contemporary psychological views of the world, that the child looks for itself, because I've taken the autobiographies of something like 1,500 artists of all kinds, and every one of them tell me one story, that they're looking for a world in which they find themselves. Right. And she said, surely we must take this seriously. I mean, seriously, it's the absolute point. It's driven the thoughts crazy while they had to listen to all this, this tremendous reversal of where the self was to be found. OK, so poem is space of appearance. What I'm going to suggest then is that the political challenge, which comes from Hewlett Cantor, uh, or I'm just using that as an example, right? Uh, Blazer responds to with an adaptation of Arendt's concept of the space of appearance. 
the voice of the poet, singular though it may be, makes evident a view of a shareable world. The theoretical challenge, which is another dimension of it, he answers with the operational language. This is a term, um, it, it comes up in, in um, the Stadium of the Mirror, an essay published uh, the same year as the tapes, 1974, Ferry Press, um, where he writes that form is alive. On the tapes, he says it this way. Now, what I'm trying to do here is suggest the whole business of the substantial and tying this is a substantial being alive and in a movement and the poetic language is the performance and visibility of that in public space. So, Blazer never denies the folds of matter and the pleats of the soul, to paraphrase Deleuze, nor the network of signifiers that has no outside, nor for that matter the micro and macro infinities of science. In fact, he embraces this kind of language. He does suggest, though, that poetry is concerned with a world scaled to human perception and that this human world requires an operational language capable of articulating experience. Adapting the phrase from Merleau-Ponte, he defines it as a mode of language use, not the construct of philosophers and linguists. Um, and I'll play you this segment from the tapes. Uh, there's a double whammy here. I'll explain after you hear it. It, he, the operational language does a couple of things, but this is how he introduces it on the tapes. When I find contemporary thought, philosophical thought, once again uh, arguing with nature of poetry, poetry as primary thought, poetry as ultimate thought, like it, it seems to be at both ends of our discourse, then what I notice is then when I get this from pony. I noticed that the language is set then to be operational. And that language which operates a thought which is sensitive to the operation of language itself rather than a language that is always being um, uh, transparent to the nature of the real. Pope, with all his brilliance and intensity, as Jack likes to describe the fearsomeness of the end of the Dunciad, for example, as something that must have, as Jack would say, scared, must have scared Pope himself. But basically, Pope's language is the language, uh, a language that is an idea system, and then any ad, any poetic aspect, imagery, metaphor, and so on, will be adornments of those ideas. And the, I use Pope now because I don't like him. I do. I could, well, I could use Don Juan, which I, which is just an absolute marvel, and one of Jack's favorite poems too. If uh, as a, a language. A language that has a tendency always to use the poetic, not as operational, not as actually dense in the language itself, not as literal to experience, so that language itself is experienced, and part of the mind, part of the body, but rather that one has a whole system of ideas and you can attach the densities of language to it in order to, to adorn it, to brighten it, to glamorize it. And I think, I think most people still do this. Like, well, that's why they can't understand poetry, why they don't handle its densities and make big mistakes on, on what it is. Anyway, poetry as operational language and philosophy as operational language does something very peculiar to my mind in the responsibility we now take for remaking a public world. And that is that we have a language always dealing with the axes of visibility. Okay, so there's a, the operational language, this is 1974, and he hangs on to that term for years. It keeps coming up. He never gets rid of that term. So it does double duty for him, I think. Um, on one hand, the operational language, as you just heard him say, is an argument against transparent, like an instrumental use of language. But on the other hand, as it morphs through his essays, it becomes an argument against the linguist system of differences, right? Just simply a structuralist view of language. That view of language, the structuralist view of language, is more concerned with the production of what in the 1970s might have been called reality effects rather than with the affective experience of what he just calls the axes of visibility. Pondering the apparent contradiction in Blazer's poetry between the fragment, that is, discrete form, thingness of thing, you know, edges, 
and the fold. McCaffrey suggests that Blazer gives theory an affective reading rather than a systematic one, and I think he, I think he does. I think that McCaffrey's right on that point. Um, whether of language, philosophy, or science, the infinities that undo form and hence image do not, in Blazer's view, discredit experience, but rather become the essential accompaniment to it. Blazer read widely in contemporary theory, but he rejected the erasure of perceptual experience as a positivism. His way of accounting for process and infinitude was to treat it as a polarity. What can be experienced has to be held in tension with what cannot, or, in Blazer's terms, the visible and the invisible are enfolded, and because they are, the visible cannot close on itself, or to repeat the quotation from Stadium, form is alive. As for the determinisms of language and sociality that seem to undermine agency, Blazer suggests that it is also a positivism to expect spontaneity of perception and then, because spontaneity has been exposed as illusion, give it all up. Experience is prepositional, inflection, response, recombination. That is its worldliness, and it is why the world rides along with the speaker of the poem. So then, the question of agency in poetry and art comes down to the rigor and sincerity with which the poet is able to articulate the real. In what seemed a curious miscommunication on the occasion of the recovery conference, Blazer responded to Altieri's questioning of agency in poetry by insisting on the existential given. There was the agency, he said. And everybody was left scratching their head, thinking he maybe didn't really understand the question or what was at issue. At the time, this comment seemed like a misapprehension of Altieri's position, because the givenness of anything, after all, was what was up for debate. But, and this is the point of my commentary, right? Blazer was moving from a different set of assumptions. If we follow his distinction between the poem as a space of appearance as opposed to an idealization, and if we also allow Blazer an operational language that is neither transparent to the world nor strictly structuralist, but rather performative, then the existential given is the necessary response. The poem brings to appearance what is, and the route from there back to public matters is that what appears then becomes a means of measure and a solicitation. It is there to be counted and accounted for. Of course, this still does not get us to Dante. The difference between a worldview founded on God and one without foundation is that between an outside view of the cosmic whole enabled by divine grace in Dante's case and the much humbler view from here. <laughs> it is the latter that Blazer proposes as appropriate to his own time and place, and yet nonetheless analogous to the historicity of Dante. The scale of the singular view then gets ramped up through collage. Out of the Berkeley experience, Robert Duncan had famously proposed poetry, capital P, as a grand collage of all cultures and times, the ongoing narrative of the human. Blazer quarreled with Duncan over what he saw as the ahistoricity of Duncan's language use, and that quarrel is well aired on the tapes. But out of that quarrel, he created his own version of a large-scale project in the serial poem, which he treated as an open-ended symposium. In other words, the serials model a space of appearance into which numerous voices, like Opal Whiteley's, as well as that of all kinds of very famous philosophers and writers and so on, are gathered. Literally assembling voices that engaged him in his readings and in his real life meetings in the world. In the context of this poetic space, the exemplarity of any one perspective is not to be presupposed. Anyone's view from here may become exemplary retrospectively if others pick it up. What is proposed as an idealization is the poem as metastructure, as open space that, through the accommodation of your view and mine, his view and hers, offers measure and method. 
so we can see who we are. No universals, no dissolving of personhood into social signifiers. Blazer resisted fiercely any suggestion that history is somehow made by anonymous forces. In the chapter on Ernst Kandorowicz on these types, he discusses his astonishment at discovering history in lectures detailing the response of persons to the problematics of their time. And this is my last clip. The point I was trying to, that, that I wanted to make was why is it so important to be historical? Because Ken Roberts not only gave me that sense of language, but he also gave me the sense of what it was to be in history. Now, I came out of a culture, and I think that most everyone else I did knew came out of a culture that had no sense that there was any history at all. You somehow had no sense of being in a movement. This is not a progr linear progression, but, but, but actual foldings that, that, that move and move and move to the point where you, you suddenly are under the image because you've because you've been there, like the Eagle of the United States, for example. I mean, you sit there reading in Cantorovitz, of course, well, the dis well, descriptions of what Suetonius said, uh, uh, Caesar's eyes looked like. And his eyes looked like the eyes of an eagle. And, and you, uh, you began building and building and building, so the symbologies began, and you began to have a vocabulary. In, in what we did through Cantorovitz is rebuild the origin of the language, the way in which the language speaks world and reopens. So the history, instead of tying us and putting us in a limited spot, reopened where we were, both backward and forward, so that we weren't linear any longer, but we were, we were actually in vast spatial movements of such size and such consequence. So Kanarovitz is historical imagination, history spatialized, I think it's clear from that clip, brings us up against the historical. We are not before or after, but with it, and not protected from it, but surrounded by it, or would deluge be the better metaphor. In this our contemporary period of a, of a befuddled and massified public, of fabricated tales of science and sociality, of politics as theater, and a consequent distrust of the political class. I suspect there are still persons at work. I began by saying that the tapes seem to come from a gone world. So what exactly is gone? Our sense of history as living space? The connection between public policy and the lives of those affected by it? The perceived efficacy of the arts at a time when so-called market forces like a Klingon warship have cloaked the faces of its operatives? Or is the problem a mistaking of the kind of agency that poetry offers in bringing the real forward? Probably all of the above. But I do not see that it follows from this state of affairs that responsibility for saying the world falls any less heavily on the poet. Blazer ends his recovery essay with a call for cultural memory. The Mahabharata and the Rigveda, like Gilgamesh and the Odyssey, are events in human consciousness which accompany the teachings of the biblical prophets, Zoroaster, Kung Fu Tse, Gautama Buddha, Christ, and Muhammad. These move us as events in the history of consciousness of how it is that men and women became human. I mean by these to suggest the tradition, along with those historical processes which derive from them that created a world or worlds. We need to know how old we are in order to gain an attitude that knows how to take care and preserve and admire the things of the world. Perhaps then, we could turn with greater assurance and finer judgment to the modern project, which is devoted to change. And I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm up for questions, if there are any questions.
the book probably discusses the context of the recordings and how it all unfolded. Um, and I can, yeah, I can tell you a little bit more about the context of the recordings. <coughs> they were just made in a living room. I think most of them at Warren's house. Um, terrible re equipment, just barbaric equipment, right? So they were literally um, <coughs> made on little cassette tapes. <coughs> And there were an, like a handful of people present. Um, Daphne Marlat, a Canadian poet, was there all the time. Warren was the principal interlocutor. He was the one whose voice you hear most of the time. His girlfriend was there, Martina Koharik. Um, and Angela Bowring was there. Angela Bowring and was, is a, was the wife of George Bowring, the poet. And then Frank Davy and uh, dropped in for one night. Frank Davy and George dropped in for one night. So they were there for one session, one particularly fiery session where all kinds of the fur flew. How many, how many nights? Ah, uh, there are ten sessions, ten sessions, and they're not of all equal length. Some are shorter than others, but there's there are twenty tapes in all. And what was the level of alcohol being consumed? <laughs> Endless, <laughs> absolutely endless. You can hear them drinking and smoking on the tapes. Yeah, there was it was it was pretty. And so, you know, the the this this was the editorial nightmare of the tapes because there's no, you know, one thing leads to the other leads to another in that context, and there's lots of digression. So if you take a given topic, let's say you know. Dante or something, that's a big one for Robin. You're going to get it in different spots because he'll start off and then the conversation will go off here and it will go off there and you know, then you'll have, to, you'll have to read around and you come back to the topic later. So it's very tough, you know, especially if you're trying to cut something of great length to, um, to do that judiciously. But I thought for the reasons I tried to outline tonight, it was worth trying to make a book out of this. And then, of course, for people who want to hear what has been cut out, um, you know, you can get it online. I think Pen Sound is going to mount all the audios. But, you know, if you want them now, you can just email me and I'll send them to you. I got them on a hard drive. So, <laughs> no problem. I can send them anywhere. <laughs> also, Simon Fraser, yeah. Yeah, I wonder if you can give us a, a, a fuller account. This is something I've never quite been able to grasp mm -hmm. of how Blazer gets from a moment in which, right, he would say that he still thinks his poetry is being written by Spicer and Blazer. Yeah. Um, Spicer and Duncan, rather. Yeah. Um, in that first essay, The Fire. And um, how he gets from that moment and their particularly distinctively anarchist politics to Arendt in the first place. How does Blazer come to believe in the possibility of a public sphere at all, given how he's, how he's operating and who he's operating with? And that's not, mm -hmm. I don't see that articulated anywhere in the essays. I, is, is it like a hidden biographical thing? It's in particles. Where does it come from? It's in particles. The, you mean the, the, the public space? Yeah, Talking, yeah. Rentian space, it's in particles in 1969. You know, he, he he um, begins in the first paragraph by crediting um, what he knows about history to Kantorowicz, what he knows about politics to Hannah Arendt. Right. I still don't understand how he moves from, or whether he had always sort of harbored this sort of belief in public space and it just wasn't coming out. Um, or is there a prehistory? Does, does Blazer have a kind of anarchist prehistory that before he gets to... Uh, kind of Arendtian politics? Well, he did go to anarchist meetings in Berkeley. That was, but that was very early. And, you know, if a 20-year-old is going to anarchist meetings, how seriously do you take that <laughs> politics? I'm not sure, you know. Uh, that's where he met Jack Spicer. And Spicer introduced him to Duncan. Who Spicer, actually, well, Spicer got him to the... Um, Spicer got him to the, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm misspeaking here. Uh, how did it go exactly? Spicer got him to the anarchist meetings. Sorry about that. Yeah, it was Spicer who was going first. 
And then he also, Spicer also introduced Robin to Duncan, who had been going to these meetings. Spicer and Duncan met at those meetings, right? But they were all, I mean, this is like 1946, 47, so they're like 20, 21, 22, you know, Duncan a little bit older, and that's it. So I know that it's, um, you know, it might seem like a leap to go from public poem to public space. But I think the problem was how you get anything public out of, out of, out of the uh, spectacle, let's say, of modernism. Right? They were, when, when they were at Berkeley, they were reading James Joyce. They're reading Ibsen. They're reading Pound. Huh? Um, these things, the, the Mallarmé, you know, um, uh, uh, Cocteau. These are all um, mentioned, in, actually, in the last part of that I've clu included on the tapes at the moderns at Berkeley. And there were, there were big lessons to be learned, but also big problems because of what had happened to a lot of, you know, especially to Pound after. <laughs> after World War II. And so how do, you, how do you address that? That was the issue, you know. Um, I think Robin was aware of Arendt, aware of her, quite early on. She was briefly at Berkeley. He never knew her then. He never got to know her. Um, he tells a story on the tapes about um, being the boy at the turnstile. She apparently... He was working in the library, and she apparently got stuck on a turnstile. She got her legs stuck on the turnstile, and he had to help her through. Um, and he says, I think she'd probably just you know, remember him as the boy at the turnstile. Um, but that, there was nothing. He was reading her work, but there was no personal relationship. And I know that he used to say, well, it's me. I, I'm the one. I'm the Arantian. In the bunch, you know, it wasn't Duncan and Spicer. I'm, I'm the Arendtian. I'm the one who really clued in to, to Hannah Arendt. And I think that what, what's key, and this comes up in a lot of essays, and it, it, as, I, as I tried to say, it's, it's, a, it's a very contentious point among Arendt's commentators, the separation of the social and the political, right? Um, I have read her critics, many of them, who say, you simply can't do that. You can't make that distinction. You know? But I think Blazer went with her on that. And so if you do have this idea of the Arantian political as a place where things appear, there is an analogy to be made with poetry there. And I think maybe the demonstration of open space hmm? would be a close. So how do you mix that with anarchist politics? Well, in a sense, you know, it's what appears in that space, right? That's the concept. I don't know if that answers the question. No, that's helpful. OK. Thank you. I could ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> I can always okay. ask a question. Um, I'm curious about, um, and this is a different use of the word social, but obviously these were born of conversation. I'm wondering, um, and his, his conversational style really sounds a lot like Duncan's in some ways, uh, and voice for a moment, mm -hmm. I almost mistook for him. Uh, I'm just curious what, um, um, you've, you've worked on his texts, um, yeah. both his essays, his poems, and now you've worked on conversation itself and mm -hmm. I just wondered what these tapes perhaps made possible for him in that space um, that his poetics didn't or I don't want to make that uh, a polar a polarity but what emerges in that space that was curious to you perhaps um, that well I do think that the in the tapes you see a uh, you see him trying to articulate a poetics that is not quite quite there I mean he'd just written Stadium of the Mirror Okay, so the fire is 1967, particles 1969, right? 
And then Stadium at the Mirror and, and the um, uh, Astonishment since 1974. Um, and I think really if you want to get a, a, a you know the the redacted view of blazer's poetry those three essays you'll find it in those three essays and so at the same time as he was doing astonishments he was also doing stadium at the mirror uh, it's around just round about the same time um, so there's lots and lots of <laughs> indirection huh that conversational digression, but also, um, I think a in the process of it, a finer tuning of his poetic, historical, cultural context huh, um, than you get just about anywhere else, right? um, and perhaps some larger, looser claims. You asked the difference between the essays and this. They're done on the moment and, you know, really after a lot of alcohol. And so everything is loosened up. Everything is loosened up. But you can hear the bones coming together, as it were. I don't know. That's not a very good metaphor, is it? But um, <laughs> you can hear the, um, you know, you can hear him thinking his way through, right? Some of the issues that 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 were that were important to him. Um, so in the first part of this, this is there's I've the the first chapter is pretty much autobiography, right? And then the second one is is about um, you know where you get to Berkeley and and the Kanarovitz lectures, and then the long Dante chapter, huh? um, and one in the moderns, right? Um, so. Those chapters, the one on Dante, Metaphysics of Light chapter, um, you can really hear him trying to push through on a certain kind of historical take on, on Dante. And he doesn't get there in his essays. That is, he's, you know, he can throw out these statements, right, um, on, on the spot. I think he must have forgotten half the time he was being recorded, you know. I mean, after four hours, right? Mm -hmm. And how many beers or whatever's later, you kind of get loose. So there's that. But also things get said. And the other thing, the other reason I think this is such an interesting document is that if you listen to him talk about Spicer and Duncan, which he does obsessively and repetitively through the whole thing, right? you get a much finer tuned sense of their differences than you, we come by in you know, 2015, where, ah, oh, yeah, that was like mid-century Berkeley, right? Berkeley was like one big lump of suet or something, right? And when you listen to him speak about that period and speak about his peers, and you realize that they were fighting all the time, and they were arguing about poetry, you begin to get a much finer tuned sense of what was at issue and about the, the similarities and differences between them. Maybe we'll allow you. Oh. Yeah, hi. Um, I understand you're writing a biography. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, you know, of Robin, yeah. Robin. So I'm, I'm wondering how long you knew him and how close you were to him. And I'm also wondering whether the biography will be a, a critical biography and yeah. how much it will integrate everything. I'm going to try for a critical biography. Um, I think Robin had come out of the grave and probably harangue if I didn't. I mean, he's, he was just fierce. And that's one of the things that stopped these tapes, right? They weren't finished. He keeps promising things. Oh, I'm going to have an evening on Adorno, and there's going to be one on a ranch and everything, and there'll be another one on Cocteau. It never happens. They just stopped. Why did they stop? There was so much tension. That was one of the reasons. There was so much tension. And, and, and part of the tension was over what these were supposed to be, right? So Warren, I mean, Robin thinks he's being asked to talk about his life, and for him, that means talking about his life in poetry, 
right? And Warren wants to wants the dirt. <laughs> yeah, he wants the good. It's like what's really happening here, right? You know, you're talking about, you know, all these other writers and so on. We're going, you're going about Joyce and you're going about Dante and you're going about Pound and you know, now what's happening to you? What are you feeling at this point? And Robin is like so, yeah. So that's one one issue. So my biography of Robin is going to be a critical biography. We'll talk about his life, but woven in with his work. So every chapter is designed to have a centerpiece of, of a work. How long I knew him? I met him as a student um, at Simon Fraser, when he was teaching at Simon Fraser. And I took a couple of his courses. I took one of his marvelous arts and context courses. He invented those courses at Simon Fraser. And they were, I mean, for the, oh dear, maybe not at Harvard. Maybe you can still do these things at Harvard, I, I would hope. But for the modern you know, university, the pared down, defunded university, they're like utopian dreams, right? Huge courses, multidisciplinary, oh. and there were no, like, no student teachers, no, 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 full faculty, you know? So he would have, um, there was periods, there would be the Renaissance, and there would be Modernism, those are the two that he taught. He would do the lectures, <coughs> and then he would have, he would, it, there'd be 250 people in the lecture hall, yeah? and then he'd break everything up into seminars, and you could choose your, you could choose your specialization. You want to do visual arts, you want to do poetry, you want to do drama, whatever you want to do, and you'd have a, an instructor in the seminar for that. And he had, I mean, in his vision for this, I've seen all this in paper, it's on the archives, you know, he had he planned that there were going to be, um, you know, singers and dancers and theatrical troops and, and just about everybody, art shows and everything to support these courses. And, you know, that was so. Anyway, that's how I met him in modernism, in the modernist class. And we got to be friends when I started to work on his poetry. Well, I thought that there wasn't much about it. And um, I had this idea that um, if I was going to be a literary critic, that it was my job to talk about what there wasn't much about. And I, I realized later that that's not a path that many people follow, but, and it was rather hard to do that, but that's how it came about. And as soon as I started to do a little bit of work on him, then I stopped taking classes from him, and we started to become friends, so I do him Gee, he died in 2009. That was about 30 years. Hmm. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>